Hi, well, uh, before starting, thank you very much to Banca Central de Chile for inviting me. It's a pleasure. So today, in the next 20 minutes, I will talk about the effect of artificial intelligence in credit risk. So it's a use case of what we have been talking about in this, in this session. So long story short, it's about a trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. So the power that Albert was mentioning and the trust problem that Maciej was uh, telling us about. And these 20 minutes will be based on three academic papers that we have done at the Financial Innovation Division of Bank of Spain. So let me start. So, well, we have, it had been said in this conference that uh, the use of artificial intelligence is gaining ground in finance, thanks to cloud computing, big data. So basically, we are in the middle of a transition between linear, reg linear regression models to deep learning models. Or if you are working with text data, we are in a transition from working with dictionaries in which we were saying which, are, which words are positive and which words are negative. We are going from there to chat GPT. So we're in the middle of a transition. And here, as, I, as an introduction, I, I just wanted to name some of the uh, possible examples of how to use artificial intelligence in central banks. Some of these projects, we are doing them at the Bank of Spain. So there are four broad uh, topics. One will be natural language processing. For example, we can use uh, large language models like ChatGPT to analyze news from newspapers, and we could have a real economic sentiment tracking. But also, in central banks, we have many documents. So we can use these models to read these documents and extract information. For example, we have a project on reading uh, terms in climate, in climate reports, or also looking at loan warranties to see if some conditions are satisfied. Another branch, another topic will be image recognition, as, as Alvaro was mentioning. How can we use this in the bank? We can use it to design banknotes or even to look for signatures in documents. A third topic will be outliers, identifying irregularities in transactions, for example. And finally, we can use artificial intelligence for prediction. We can try to predict bankrupts, we can try to predict GDP, and we can try to predict default. And this is where I'm going to zoom in. So this presentation is about artificial intelligence in credit risk. So why am I, are we zooming in here? First, because credit risk is essential for financial stability, and it's a key part of individuals' life for home ownership or entrepreneurship. But second, because focusing on artificial intelligence and credit scoring, I think we can illustrate very well the opportunities and risks of using artificial intelligence in finance and central banks. So again, the green light, the opportunities will be a higher predictive ability. The red light will be, this is much more complex and we will have validation challenges, particularly for interpretability and biases. So the first part of the presentation, the opportunities, and then I will move to the risks. And this is based on the research we have done and, in, and literature review. So opportunities. If you, this is in one slide, the summary of the opportunities. So again, I, as I said, better predictive, better predictive ability. What does it mean? It means that you can have a better precision or better true positive rate or better area under the curve, any statistical measure. And the gains could be up to 20%. And what have we learned? We learned that tree-based models like random effects, uh, sorry, like random forest or XGBoost seems to be better than deep learning. This, this is the summary of the opportunities. And which could be the economic impact? So, well, a better prediction of default could decrease the loss from default up to 10%. But also, if you are able to predict better default, the gains in regulatory capital savings could be up to 20%. So now we will zoom in into why, why um, this is true. And also there could be increased financial inclusion, although here the, 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 the evidence from the literature is mixed. Okay, so let's, let's see what... I, so we have, again, we have written three papers on this matter. So let's understand why, first, why, why is this true? Why, why can't we have a better predictive ability when we use machine learning? So this is the only equation I will show you today. And this is a logistic regression. On the left-hand side, we will have the probability of default of an individual. So this could be zero or one. And on the left-hand side, we have typical determinants to see if someone will default, like income, age, home ownership, etc. So this is the logistic model that we all know, and it works quite well. The problems with this logistic regression is it learns only linear decision boundaries, and also, if you want to see the effect of home ownership and age, the interaction, you will, you will have to put that interaction manually. You will have to put it in the equation. 
However, we can use non-linear, non-parametric models like the ones we have uh, been introduced before, like random forest or deep learning. So random forest here on the right-hand side is just you have many trees. In each tree, you split the sample according to a key value of a feature. You add in, add in non-linearities, and then you, you reach a consensus. Or you can use deep learning, and this, this simple neural network has five input variables. Income, age, due past, debt ratio, and home ownership. But you can connect them in thousands of ways. So instead of having only one way to connect these variables, you have thousands. And also, in each of the, in each of the neurons, you're adding nonlinearities. So bottom line, with random forest or deep learning, you can model more complex relationships between variables. And credit default is influenced by a multitude of factors. So these models can help us. So what has said the literature about this? I, can, I will summarize you the, the, some of the main papers some uh, published or, or from central banks. So what these papers have in common in this table, all of them look at some kind of credit data like corporate loans, mortgages, or consumer loans. And all of them use a machine learning model and Logit. So all of them use Logit as a benchmark. So let's see how do these machine learning models uh, improve Logit. So you can see, let's focus on the last two papers, for example. So the last one is one in which we did in the, in the Financial Innovation Division. Consumer loans, 80,000 loans, and we saw that XGBoost had an area under the curve, which is a statistical metric of 85%, and Logit 78%. Okay. Or, for example, the one before the last, using deep learning, 90%, and Logit 86%. So, what, but what does this mean, having, which is the economic impact of having this higher precision? So, what, what does it mean to have 20% more AUK or higher or higher true positive rate. Well, again, this is a summary of, of the literature and our own research. So, for example, Candiani, they, they, they using random forest, they find that if you improve by 5% precision, you can have savings from 6 to 25% in losses. So these are big numbers. Or Albanese says, we have deep learning model. I think they, they had a deep learning model predicts 4% better than Logit, and the, the, the savings could be up to 9%. But also in our research, we found that improving by 7% Logit, you can have regulatory capital savings of up to 17%. With, with, of course, this depends on the data. This depends if it's consumer loans or corporate loans. But in the literature, there is another paper that says with corporate bonds, up to 25%. So, okay, yeah, up to here, this is the first half of the presentation. We are talking about big numbers, two-digit numbers. Now let's, and we can talk later why capital regulatory savings, but this, this will take more time. Okay, so if we use machine learning for credit risk, we can have huge economic impact, but, but there are many risks associated with this. So then we, we came to our second paper in which my co-author and I decided to do a, a checklist like Maciej was saying. There is not a magic checklist, but you have to use, you, have, you need for, uh, a checklist for each use cases. And this is the case. This is the checklist we came for credit scoring. So basically, my co author and I, we were looking at which are the obstacles for validating a machine learning model from us in a central bank when you use machine learning model instead of, of a logic. And these are the 13 factors we found. We grouped them into statistics, technology, and market conduct. For example, in statistics, we were checking how stable is a deep learning model instead of a logit. How, how difficult it is to find the hyperparameters. In a logit, you don't, this is not a problem, but with a deep learning model, you have to take into account the, the architecture. So again, we had all these factors, but I would like to focus in the last 10 minutes in the last one, interpretability. Why? Because the other factors also could be, these are problems as well when you are using econometric models. But the problem of interpretability is the problem that we, we believe that is like the new one. So what do we mean by interpretability? We mean to interpretability, by interpretability, we mean understand, understanding the outcome of a model. And here there is a debate. There is a debate about if the consumers have the right to an explanation. So there is an ongoing discussion about the consumer's right to receive an explanation when you deny credit to them. So basically, let's, let's go to the legal landscape I, and some of the things uh, we'll see that uh, have been told before. There is no a legal mandate that tells you open the black box. That's not, that has not been said, but there are regulations 
that in an indirect way, they oblige you to open the black box. For example, GDPR in Europe tells you uh, you require human judgment in, automa in, in automated decision making. Okay, you can use a super complex deep learning model, but then you need human judgment, so you need to understand something of the model. But also we have the, um, well, we, the, the, again, this, this credit, it has, this is highest stakes impact, it, these decisions affect individuals, again, home ownership or entrepreneurship, and we have the European uh, Union Artificial Intelligence Act that Maciej was talking about before, which basically is a regulation from the European Commission that establishes standards for how to apply artificial intelligence in Europe. And guess what? A credit risk is a high, sorry, applying artificial intelligence in credit risk is a high risk activity. So that means that you have to be particularly careful with transparency, particularly careful with accountability, and there are many conformity tests. And what about the US? Well, in US there are two laws. These are not about artificial intelligence. These are two laws about lending, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the Fair Housing Act. That, avoid, that try to avoid discrimination. So they anti-discrimination laws covering disparate treatment. Basically, if you deny credit to someone, you have to give an adverse action notice and explain why. And of course, if you don't, if you use a deep learning model and you don't understand anything, it will be difficult to give this adverse action notice. And what about the biases? If we don't understand the outcome of a model, we cannot we will not be able to spot the bias. And if you do know that there is a bias and you want to, to solve it, you will need to understand the model, right? So now let, let's see how can, so why is it so difficult to interpret a model? So in one slide again, here we have again our logistic regression, very simple. So you have the probability of default. And if you wanna see the effect of income, you focus on beta one and you see if beta one is statistically significant, if it's positive, you put income, you see the marginal impact, etc. But imagine that we have a simple neural network. So this is a very simple neural network. So income, instead of having one weight, it has already six, and this is a very simple neural network. Income has three weights to each of the nodes in the inner layer, but then all those nodes go to the output, so you have six weights. And this is a super simple neural network. If you have, um, if you use a deep learning model with th three hidden layers and 100 nodes, which is fairly standard size, you will have 22,000 weights associated to income. So that's impossible. And then, of course, if you use ChatGPT, you have billions of weights. So, how, so what can we do about this? There, there is a, 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 an, an interpretability gap between logic and deep learning. Traditional econometric models can be explained, are inherently explainable, but, we, but machine learning models are complex. So this is where we come and where I will spend the last seven minutes talking about this field that is called explainable AI. So explainable AI is about creating techniques that can open the black box. You, ca you can try to explain the model locally, so you can try to explain a particular loan decision, or you can have a global de uh, decisions. And some of the techniques, um, um, well, I will focus on something called the post hoc interpretability techniques. So these are techniques that, have, that you can apply to any model. You have a logit, you have a random forest, you have a deep learning, you train them, you find the weights, and then you can apply these techniques to understand what's going on. But this is only a way, so the, the, you can use these techniques or maybe you can use a simple model or you can try to restrict the complex model. But I will focus on these post hoc interpretability techniques to open the black boxes. And probably some of the names sound familiar to you, SAP, LIME, or permutation feature importance. And basically this is where, our th where, this is where, where we are doing research now. We are trying to understand how good are these techniques for credit scoring, if they work, and when do they not work. So let, let me explain how these techniques work. This, the, the most simple one. This is the most simple one to open a, a black box. This is called permutation feature importance. The basic idea is very simple. You evaluate the model's performance with and without a feature and you, to, to measure the feature importance. So basically, if you want to see the importance of income, you just do some data shuffling. You, for, each, for income, you randomly change the value of income, but you keep the other values, the other variables steady, age, home ownership, and default. And then you check, second step, if there is a performance drop, 
so the idea is if I change the values of income and the model has the same accuracy, then income should not be important. And this is the importance metric, accuracy or true positive rate. And you do this many times because, of course, you can just make one shuffle and you might be unlucky. Now the question is, is this enough to open a black box? So th this has many problems. Okay, the, the good thing is this simple. We understand it. But the, the, uh, I, I, I have been able to explain you this in, in one minute. But there are many problems. First, if income is correlated with age, you might be underestimating the effect of income because you are moving income, but age is the same. So you're creating unrealistic scenarios. Second, this has a problem with categorical variables. It's very, very unstable. Third, this is, this is computationally expensive. You have to repeat this many times. Four, you have to take into account the interactions between variables, and this doesn't do that. I mean, maybe it's not just move, it's not income what is important, but it's income plus age. So this, which is the simplest, have already many problems. There are other techniques, and SAP probably is now the, the standard, and now I, I don't have to go over it, but it solves some of the problems, but not, not all of them. And let, let's do an example in the last three minutes. This is an example. You can go to Google and Google give me some credit. It's a database from Kaggle. You can download it for free. And let, let's do this example. This is a credit database that is available in Google. It has 100,000 loans. There is a binary target that says if the applicant defaulted or not. And we have 11 variables, so only 11. Income, age, the ratio, etc. If you download this and apply XGBoost, that is a machine learning model, or Logit, you have a 6% difference in AUK, which is a, standard, is a standard statistical metric. Only with 11 variables, so it's not true that you need hundreds of thousands of variables. With 11, 6% difference. And what does it mean, 6% difference? Could be 10% difference in, capital, in regulatory capital, etc. But now we ha let's interpret XGBoost. So this is using Python. If you are out of curiosity, using Python, there are libraries, nice libraries, that implement SAP and permutation feature importance. So the right-hand side is the technique I explained to you. What does it say? It says that revolving, which is the, the percentage of the credit limit that the applicant hit, has an effect of 8% in the performance of, um, of the XGBoost. Then we have how many, how, many, how many times you have been late in 90 days, etc. And this is SAP, which is similar. It gives you a ranking of the variables. I'm sorry, maybe it's a bit small, but you can apply these techniques, but there is here a new problem. Both techniques agree on revolving, but what about credit lines? According to, credit, according to SAP, credit lines is the four, more the four most important variable, but according to permutation, future important is the six. So these techniques have di differences between them. But also, if I run these techniques again, they might give different results because this, you're applying a technique to the technique. So, this, so you, the, the, these techniques are not very stable. So right now we're doing the cutting edge research is how to improve these techniques so that they, we, are, we trust them. I mean, they, they are giving you a result, a ranking of the variables. But again, many pro are, there, are many problems, uh, so there are many problems. So again, many questions arise. How to define the discrepancy? So one technique is saying me that credit lines is important, and the other technique is saying that not. How problematic is this? Also, there are, there are, there are discrepancies within the models. And, and four, is this enough as an explanation? Are you, are, are you convinced by this? Will this be enough for an, an adverse uh, notice in, in, according to the European Credit Act? But, so the literature is now trying to improve these techniques to make them more reliable. And in, and in our third paper, what we are doing is creating synthetic data and trying to make many different scenarios to see how reliable are these techniques that open the black boxes. And some results are the techniques work, but the correlation of the data set, if the, if the data set is very correlated, that might affect a lot these, these interpretability techniques. So let me summarize. Machine learning brings great benefits in credit risk, could bring benefits, better prediction, could and huge economic impact, could have better financial inclusion, but mixed evidence. But it has a huge problem uh, from the point of view of the interpretability. There are techniques that try to open the black box, but there are many problems with these techniques as well.
So other mitigating factors, I have been talking about credit risk all the time, and I have said anything about an expert on credit. We should bring aboard an expert on credit, so not only applying methods. So we need humans and expertise, and of course, taking into account the ethical principles we're, we're talking about. We need econometrics. This is not about forgetting about econometrics. It's, like, it's not, logic doesn't matter anymore. We, need, we, need to, we might need to restrict the complex models with some restrictions, monotonicity restrictions, etc. And last, something that has been said before, we need formation and, and lecture and, and literacy in these models. And that's all from my part. Um, I think we, we have a few minutes, in fact, for questions. So is there questions in the, in the room? Yes, over there. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a question for Maziek regarding the last part of your presentation, and it is the following. Without a legal framework, how an organization like a central bank can use these technologies, making sure that personal data or intellectual property, for example, are being protected in order to not lose the institutional trust? So we take a few more. And we, because they were these and um, first of all, I would like to thank you, everyone. It was a, like I learned a lot about AI for me as. Uh, Jose Manuel said, it's kind of a black box that is really difficult to, to understand. So, as Alvaro said, uh, these models start growing, and then there is not a clear line where, when these models start reasoning. So, that will lead to statistical institutions to, to, to think about accountability, trustworthiness of their results, because there is a black box box that is giving you the results. For instance, when dealing with um, data that is generated by human behavior, these AI models can replicate biases that people have. So how can we deal with these biases that models give when you don't have a clear line how these models work? Many thanks. Any other questions around the table? Well, thank you very much for your presentations. And there is also a, a question for Maciej. And it's how central banks, for example, can leverage artificial intelligence to enhance their supervision and overall effectiveness in maintaining financial stability and also integrity. Thank you. So, Hello. I guess there are, oh yeah, yeah. Hello, uh, thanks for your presentations. I have a question for Alvaro Soto. I would like to know your thoughts about the following. You described reasoning displayed by large language models as an emergent property. But is what is being displayed really reasoning? Or is it that having such a vast memory catalog allows you to approximate reasoning very well? Maybe indistinguishably so? And also, we seem to be brute forcing our way to artificial reasoning. Can this path lead to artificial general intelligence? I think I can close. Well, uh, there are two questions for Maciek, one for Alvaro, one general on the accountability. I would add one for you, Rosé, because you, you spoke about credit risk assessment in the private industry, in fact. But what would be interesting is what is the lessons for, for the central bank as a supervisor of financial institutions based on the credit they, they take. Uh, so, Alvaro, you, you want to start because you have to leave. Sorry, I have to leave at 3.15. Um, so first, uh, from the presentation, I want to mention some um, clarification. When I, in my presentation, when I talk about these uh, images, audio, you know, in that kind of problems, you know, the variables, for example, in the images are pixels. So pixels are 
very no information. But in the other cases, for example, when you had a, a problem, like the statistician usually has a problem, when you had a variable that is age, salary, that is very semantic. I my belief that that set two different problems. You know? um, so that, that's something for, for clarification. I think it is important for you that the problem that I talked was different you know, in, in that sense. So about the question, uh, th that's something I mean, the question about what, what is this is reasoning or is not reasoning, well, I, I don't have the answer for that, really. Uh, this is an emerging property, and it, 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 it needs further research to see what are the mechanisms that are behind the, the output that we are seeing. You know? It seems to be that it's more than just memory, because it's able to articulate, you know... The thing is that when you are memory, you have a direct relation between a stimulus and, and, and the, the output is a reactive system. When you had reasoning, you had some rules that can regulate the interaction between input and output. So to me, uh, in my research, we have been seeing that the models are able to grasp it or get, get, learn some of these rules. So what rules are able to learn, what are not, that's some, or how it, it happens that at some point it's no memory, it's rule. That's something that it, it needs further research, and, and it's a very hot, hot topic today in, in artificial intelligence. And, and about the size, what happens if we keep increasing the size? You know, we can get some general intelligence? Uh, I don't know, really, too. Uh, I don't know what other emerging properties it can emerge. That, that's kind of dangerous, you know? it's kind of scary. Uh, what other emerging properties can? So that needs regulation, that needs responsibility, and we will see. So I have to leave. Sorry. Thank you very much Please. for the invitation. Many thanks. So we continue. We take a few more minutes to address the remaining questions. So, Masiak, you, you had several questions. Um, yes. So. Um, when there is a legal regulation, it's in practice says you have to do it, because if you don't do it, you will be liable or you will be uh, fined. What I presented in my presentation, and I think as well in yours, there were a list of certain components, and you probably remember this spider, when there are a list of components which needs to be observed. and. Uh, legal regulation which will only tell you you have to look on that one and you have to interpret this in this particular way but nothing stops you when you have a use case to analyze what is important for this particular use case to make it trustworthy and from legal perspective it's, it's simply this will build trust because people will see that even without legal regulation you are approaching this in a very um, in a way that helps society in practice to uh, to stay uh, very uh, very stable and this is uh, this is answer for the first question i hope that i answer your question mm -hmm. and the second one if i may ask to repeat the question because i didn't grasp the question so um, if this would be possible, that would be super cool. I think it was on and how to enhance supervision to promote financial stability. Okay. And my question was how central banks, for example, uh, can leverage artificial intelligence to enhance their supervision and overall eff effectiveness in maintaining financial stability and also integrity? Oh, that's, uh, uh, there is uh, probably a, a lot of, lot of uh, examples or possibilities when you look in the subtech. And uh, things like, um, you know, analyzing and available in the internet information about uh, banks, uh, getting uh, or making artificial intelligence under uh, getting, uh, getting the information, um, for example, if the, what is the uh, possibility for this particular institution to default? You know, analyze the available data from the uh, social media. 
analyze as well, you know, the millions of articles which are, uh, you know, going into the market. So typically artificial intelligence is very good and at uh, analyzing very granular data sets where there is a lot of, lot of information and then if there is, um, if, of course, the use case needs to be defined and objectives needs to be defined and then respective, uh, um, you know, algorithm has to be built uh, and trained. But uh, in practice, there are endless possibilities, really. And uh, I'm just, uh, even um, as simple things as, uh, getting through the uh, articles and uh, selecting the articles will potentially can be relevant is of great help. So that we don't need from the very beginning to build a, uh, an algorithm which will do the whole thing. We can select elements and get those low hanging fruits first and then later on think how to put this all together in the algorithm which will then get us to a certain uh, result which we would like to achieve. I hope that I was clear enough. Perfect. Rosé, your thoughts? Mm, yes. So regarding your question on, so when central banks have to supervise other, mo so central banks have to supervise the, logis the logistic, well, the models that the, other, the commercial banks are using to, to lend, and this is, and of course, that's why we wanted to do the checklist of things that would be that would be much more complicated if commercial banks use deep learning instead of, um, mm -hmm. of logic. Not so, not only complicated but impossible. And uh, that's why we, I wanted to highlight interpretability because you have to trust these techniques, and so far it's difficult to trust them. Mm -hmm. So, for, from a central bank supervisory point of view, this creates a lot of trouble in validation models, and that's what um, what I wanted to show with that checklist. Not only Stability, okay, a logic can be unstable as well, but uh, the, hyp the hyperparameters, the, the overfitting, uh, that was a huge problem as well. But I wanted to highlight interpretability. And, um, and oh, there was a, another question regarding bias. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I, um, if you are not able to, you open, you use a black box and you can say nothing about how the output has been produced, it's gonna be very difficult to, 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 to spot a bias. I mean, you can see the bias in the results, and you might use a logit, there is no bias, you use deep learning and there are some bias in the result. But it, maybe you can spot it, but then how, how to solve it is impossible if you don't know what's going on within the model. Maybe you can use uh, one of these post-hoc interpretability techniques and see which variables are at the, top, at the top and try to think, are these variables behind any kind of bias? But again, if you don't have any clue of how to interpret these models, then it's gonna be impossible to fix, to fix that bias. But of course, the key problem that was mentioned by the mm. gentleman is that you may have bias in the data themselves. You don't give credit mm. to this particular population. Mm. So just having exactly the same model mm. perpetuates, in fact, the bias. It, that's a good point. That's why when I did the checklist, the bias is also a problem that can happen with logic. So I wanted to focus on interpretability because it's the only one that I see that is completely unique. The other problems are just amplified by using artificial intelligence. Stability, hyperparameters, the bias, because the bias is in the data. So. Well, I think we have to stop. I learned a lot. I think it was very interesting. I think Rosé made a very interesting case that uh, the benefits can be huge, because in terms of, for example, economic capital, uh, it can be huge to apply these techniques. I, I think Massier can convince that governance uh, to maintain trust is, is important. Basically, like when you buy a car, you cannot understand what is a black box in your car. You have to trust someone. You have to trust the fact that there is some kind of regulation. And Alvaro, I think, made the case that we, we, there is a lot of knowledge that can be used. Though so I still have some doubts because I remember the great crisis, well, you remember, 20 years ago, when the key issue was the unknown unknown. So I'm still wondering what would an, an AI tool say at that time? Uh, because the things that we observed in the financial markets were unknown. And um, I, we should perhaps have an experiment to test what the AI tool would have said at that time, given the information that we had. 
And perhaps they would have resolved the crisis, or perhaps they would have amplified the crisis. Who knows? Uh, but I would like to thank you very much. It was very rich, and I would like to thank the panelists.